two things I noticed while having a look through uh, some of the key messages. Um, the first was communities must be put at the heart of climate resilience. And the second thing I noticed uh, in many of these messages is that we must not have a siloed approach, uh, that there is a need to work jointly um, across uh, different sectors and different groups of people and different levels of society. Um, but in this session, what we're going to try and do is um, throw the conversation forward. Um, so we're going to look uh, at where do we take work on adaptation from here, and also going into 2020, which is obviously a key, key year um, for the international climate negotiations and for climate ambition, um, what is important um, for uh, our four speakers. So I'll just quickly introduce them. Um, on my far right is uh, Bisola Akinwiwa. Bisola grew up in um, an informal settlement in Lagos, Nigeria, Ituagan. Um, she's a member of the uh, Nigerian branch of Slum Dwellers International and a founding member of their youth media team. Uh, she works as a community paralegal uh, with uh, Justice and Empowerment Initiatives Nigeria and she provides grassroots legal aid uh, to the urban poor. And next to Bisola is Sheila Patel, who I think is known to everybody here. Um, Sheila is the founder and director of the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centres in Mumbai and she works um, in partnership with the National Slum Dweller Federation and Mahila Milan, which are two community-based groups working um, with the poor in Indian cities. She's also chair of Slum Dwellers International and uh, recently she was named as one of the commissioners of the Global uh, Commission on Adaptation, which is obviously a very important job and uh, uh, very um, relevant in terms of being able to feed uh, in uh, messages from events like this. Um, Next to me on my left, I have Salim, who probably needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever, Director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development and Senior Fellow at the International Institute for Environment and Development. On my far left, we have Louise Cord, who is the uh, Global Director for Social Development at the World Bank's uh, Sustainable Development Practice Group. So we have a wide range of uh, people and interests represented here. So, um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is um, ambition in adaptation. I was at the COP uh, all of last week and when we talk about ambition there, it's basically a shorthand for ambition in terms of how far we can raise targets uh, on cutting emissions. However, I do believe that in the Paris Agreement there's also a, a global adaptation goal. Um, and this gets relatively little attention. I just checked back on some of the language before coming into this session, um, and the Global Adaptation Goal includes strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change. And it also says that adaptation action should follow participatory approaches that take into consideration vulnerable groups, communities, and ecosystems. Now, it struck me that taking into consideration is passive language, actually. Um, but what we want to talk about today is, is action, basically, and ambition, and how does that look in the context of adaptation. So um, I'm going to start by asking uh, Bisola. Bisola, how does your work uh, help people in informal communities in Lagos adapt to climate change? And what would you like to see happening uh, in order to um, protect people more effectively? Mm, thank you. Um, maybe, maybe you should just ask that, what are we doing? Not how my work? <laughs> because it's just like a collective actions of the movement, not coming together. Um, actually, what we are doing now is, um, Firstly, try to make other, other slum dwellers communities in Lagos, Nigeria to understand what we call climate change. You know, when we say climate change, it is a big drama to we the slum dwellers. We don't really know what climate change is when you pronounce it. But what we try to do is we make ourselves to understand this big drama that we call climate change. When we understand it, we try to go for um, the local ways of doing it. 
we have some of us that um, when this comes to flooding or sea level rising, they have their local system of doing it. In terms of sea level rising, those houses that are on, on water, they need to, they know the season that it comes right, so they need to like raise up the, um, the um, uh, foundation of it before that time. And in terms of um, 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 fishing aspects, they also, those fishermen also know how the seasons work for them in terms of um, catching. But what we try to do is um, we go beyond that, we create awareness, we educate ourselves on what climate change is all about and things we need to do in order to save our environment. Um, we, we try to get them for what they call um, um, waste to wet and um, we make them to understand that the separation of waste and how to work on the reduction of emission. And for now, we are hoping because some of the communities, the lack of basic um, services like um, no drainage, no toilets, no electricity. So we also add that to our plan on how to make that to come to reality um, through savings, because we deal with savings as SDI and information center. So we try to do that. And we we'll have our um, database to present as a part of um, negotiations to have all these basic um, services. And we also try to um, um, set up our goals for next year, which is um, to, to, to create more community and climate warriors. That is the word we call them. You know, warriors. yes, warriors. Warriors, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, maybe we have that at the local level, uh, uh, global level, called the global community uh, warriors. So, um, in order for, for us to like prevent climate change when it's come to this season, because they will be in charge of understanding this and the next thing that they need to do in order to prevent this being happening. So, that is the state that we are now, we are hoping to take it to the next stage. And we also have this um, solar system that we put in place um, in terms of um, reduction of emissions. Um, we call it go green because <laughs> we want everything to go back to green in order for us to enjoy the sound health that our grandfathers, great grandfather enjoyed there. So we want to enjoy that. So we call it go green um, in terms of introducing solar back so that we'll be able to use solar in terms of light, um, um, also in terms of um, this fishing aspect, to use machine that we're using solar in terms of gas cooking to fix it in the solar way so that it will reduce the um, emissions of the carbon that goes out. So that is what we are trying to plan on now. As of now, we have the solar that empowers us in terms of to see who is there in terms of darkness. But we haven't got far to um, like streets light and what we vision for. We hope to achieve that next year. And I'm just wondering what um, you think would be most useful in terms of helping you to take that work forward. What, what's missing? What do you find is needed most? You know what? We have this plan on ground. And what will be helpful in terms of this is the support. Not just support from anywhere but mostly from our government. We have this plan, but if our government can just understand that the people that are here, they have their plan, all we just have to do is for us to work together to emerge their plan with the one that they have on the ground. It really help us. It will help our struggle. It will reduce our struggle. So if you can just get this support, it will be easier for us. And that's not just financial support, that's planning we, support. We also need the one of financial support. <laughs> but um, if you can just think on have the support of our government and other other private sector that can assist in terms of fund, it, it, it really helps our struggle. But when we have the support, our government out there still come and try to frustrate us. When I mean frustration, in terms of eviction, I don't know if most of us know about eviction. When we have all this in place, and our government out there came in and tried to, okay, so you have done this, well done, good, but I need to evict you guys to have this land or something like that. All our efforts will just be 
to abort it. So what we need is we need food, but we also need the support of our government. Let them also reason with us with what we have. We have our plan. Thanks very much. And Sheila, obviously working with um, organisations um, like the Solars, and also you, you know, you, you're able to feed things up to the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, I'm just wondering how you feel communities like the Solars should be supported in order to better adapt to climate change. So first of all, I think. The issue is not that everybody is supporting communities, they are supporting all of you. None of us, at least all of us who live in the global south, we are so interdependent on each other, we never recognize the contributions that people living informally do to our lives. So, so for, for us, the, the most important and powerful contribution is that when poor people get organized over long periods of time, as we have demonstrated ourselves and the other social movements, you have serious constituencies that can participate in transformation. They are a gift to development. Yet they are not being recognized, they are treated badly, our governments don't recognize us, NGOs don't, in many cases, respect what they do, and the development business treats poor people like beneficiaries and consumers. Now this is also going to come into the climate space. And it's very important for all of us as grassroots activists to make sure that we don't allow this to repeat itself. That's for me the first thing that we hope as social movements we bring to the climate space. The second thing is that Everything that we do, starting from fighting evictions, to seeking basic services, to seeking visibility in the city, is so integral to the SDGs and to the social justice element of an adaptation of climate change. And yet, it's so neglected. There's an, always an assumption that some bilateral and some multilateral organization is going to throw money and it's going to change everything. It's not. I think for me, the most powerful understanding of adaptation is when we disrupt this situation where people don't take charge of what they can do and collectively force their governance institutions to play their role. Because neither the government by itself or the international groups here can do it by themselves. We all have to pitch in. And I think poor people if they understand the logic of the choices, they are there before any of us. And so I think that our real contribution as social movements, urban, rural, many of whom are here, and most are not here, I hope that the next time you have this, that every social movement which has global representation is here, and you treat them as partners. I think, you know, when you see that, the people who care most about it are communities. We, we all hear so many people dismiss this kind of activism of our children, but movements don't. And for me, I'm Bisola's grandmother. So you guys better support her. <laughs> Salim, inside the UN climate process uh, and uh, you know what's going on under the Paris Agreement, is there room for social movements? And if not, how should that room be made in your view? Because we experience this process as essentially a top-down process with very little uh, bottom-up input. Thank you, Megan, and uh, good evening to everybody. So, as I mentioned in the opening um, session as well, this is my 25th uh, COP. I've been to all, all of them, exactly. Uh, so I'm a grandfather as well. And, but I'm not a negotiator. I never come here as a negotiator. I come as an observer. And my role is to link the bottom with the top. And this creation of this space is one of those formats in which we've done it. So let me pick up on the 
the issue that you mentioned on actually in the Paris Agreement, we have an Article 7 where we have agreed a global goal on adaptation. Now that's a tricky question because unlike mitigation where we have a long-term temperature goal, we cannot assign a single adaptation because it's so location specific. So the scientific community working on adaptation in which I'm uh, one of my, my center is one of the players, are all grappling with how do we come up with a global goal and then how do we measure progress towards that goal. And there are several schools of thought in this. Some are looking at a macro, top-down, global goal and then measuring which countries are progressive towards that. Um, some people have more technical aspects. We belong to one school of thought, which is a bottom-up school of thought, which is the global goal is to make every citizen of planet Earth understand the problem, wish to do something about it, start doing something about it, and succeed in doing something about it. Those are the four steps in building resilience to climate change and starting with the most vulnerable communities themselves, not with the people at the top. And that's what I do, that's my day job. I spend three weeks at the COP every year, but the rest of the, the year I spend on the ground in Bangladesh working in my university. I'm a teacher. I teach my students, the students teach the people there. I work with local communities. That's what I specialize in, capacity building of the most vulnerable to be able to be the champions and the leaders on tackling climate change. And when it comes to measuring progress, they are the ones who measure progress, not us measuring their progress, them measuring our progress. And what are some of the lessons you think that um, the rest of the world could learn from the work that's been done in Bangladesh? Because I know that you've been saying for a long time that you know there's a lot that the North can learn from the South. What are some of the key lessons on adaptation that are coming out of the work in Bangladesh? Yeah, you, you, you just opened the Pandora's box there, and I can go for hours. On it. So I'll give you two two messages. Uh, the first one, and I'm going to make an assertion which I'm very happy to, you know, defend and, and argue with people. My country, Bangladesh, 160 million people, is the most climate aware country in the entire world. We had our Prime Minister here the other day on Monday. She's going to be taking over the Climate Vulnerable Forum from the, uh, the President of uh, Marshall Islands, Hilda Hyde. My Prime Minister can give you a one hour speech on climate change. She's extremely knowledgeable. My finance minister can give you a speech on climate change. We're not just talking environment people. At the same time, people on the streets can tell you all about climate change. And I'll give you one indicator. In Madrid right now, we have four private television channels of Bangladesh who sent with their own money TV crews here, and they're reporting back to their audience in Bangladesh every day what is a pop, what's happening at the COP, what's happening every day at the COP on Article 6, on loss and damage. People in Bangladesh know more about what's happening here than people in Madrid, all right? And so that is a level of awareness, and we're moving from awareness to solutions. And we've gone a long way in the solution space on adaptation, from community-based adaptation to national planning. And again, I won't give you the long speech, but the, the short answer is you have to come to Bangladesh and see where we are. Thank you. Who could refuse that invitation? Um, Louise, so obviously the World Bank uh, is ambitious on adaptation. We heard that from your, um, your head last year. Um, and it's going to put more money into adaptation. Um, so I'm just wondering what that might look like in terms of Bangladesh, in terms of Nigeria, India. What kind of practical efforts is that going to translate into on the ground? Okay, well thank you. First of all, it's my, I may be a grandmother, but it's my first COP and my first development in climate days, and this has been a really great event with lots of fantastic ideas, so, so thank you. And yes, the World Bank takes climate change incredibly seriously. It's central to our agenda. We consider it to be one of the defining challenges of the 21st century. And we're increasing our financing for adaptation. We're doubling it over the next five years, going from 20, from 10 million billion a year to excuse me, 5 billion a year to 10 billion a year for a total of 50 billion, obviously, for 2021 and 2025. So where is this money going to go? What's it going to fund? Well, first, social protection, what we call adaptive social protection, giving cash transfers and supporting communities. When there is a drought, when the climate conditions become adverse, there's a flood, we're able to increase our safety nets that are already in place. 
Secondly, improving um, investments across the board. So in marine plastics, on environment, on the green agenda, the brown agenda, and the blue agenda, on as well as on um, goodness, smart agriculture and coastal zone protection, forestry protection. So getting the money out to the communities. Third, on improving how we the data that we're collecting in supporting countries in improving their data collection through better hydro met systems, through better early warning systems that can collect and analyze that data. We're also looking at climate finance in a different way, working much more with the Ministry of Finance to ensure that this money is mainstream throughout all programs, that its climate issues are part of the National Development Plan and part of our own diagnostics. And third, to look at some of these metrics for resilience, because as you were saying, you were just saying, it's easy to understand, not easy, but we can have a clear goal on the mitigation side, but we also need to have uh, goals on the resilience side. So what are some new metrics that we can look at on resilience as well? And I'm just wondering, what kind of processes does the World Bank use in order to bring in uh, the voices of the communities that your work is intended to benefit? So one of the things I wanted to say is that I can make a commitment to have this money be go more to the local level than ever before. We in the group that I manage social, thank you, social development, we go bring money to the communities, community-driven development funds, for example, which the community gets together, decides on its vision, its values, how they want to see their development over the next couple of years. And then as part of that process, we're supporting it to include activities on mitigation at the local level. In addition, and I'll talk a little bit about this maybe in, in down the road, we're also supporting county governments and local governments to mainstream climate actions throughout their national development plans. So that's one very concrete way we're working to get uh, adaptation finance down to the local level. And as we're hearing um, at the COP, um, and also here, um, Andy Norton spoke about it earlier, saying, you know, we are all now working in the context of a climate emergency. Um, you know, there is no time to lose. Urgent action is required. So we wanted to talk here today a little bit about what are the plans for the next year in the run-up to the Glasgow COP, um, which, as we know, is the time by which countries are supposed to have submitted their enhanced uh, nationally determined con contributions or their national climate action plans. They're supposed to have stepped them up by the end of next year. Um, and, you know, that needs to be on adaptation as well as on emissions because as we're constantly hearing there's more extreme weather, seas are, are rising, uh, you know we're not we're not winning uh, in terms of keeping temperature rise down. So I just wanted to ask our panelists basically what are your priorities uh, for the next year and what are you hoping to achieve in terms of your work? Um, you know in, in order to be able to speed up uh, and deliver with communities uh, the extra kind of protection um, that they need. So um, we'll start with um, we'll start with Basola and Basola, what are you hoping to do um, in terms of working with your climate warriors um, and uh, other things that you're doing over the next year or so? And what would you like to see governments doing um, at next year's COP, the big one? Thank you. So, <laughs> let me be a bit flexible here. <laughs> um, in terms of, um, let me start with government aspect. I don't really want to see this attitude of <laughs> whenever they are finding themselves in with a local, I don't want to see this attitude of inevitable, mechanism, um, inconstitutionally, um, is nepotism, is I don't want to see that from them. Do you know what I mean? Whenever they are coming for us, they come with all these different sorts of drama. We don't want that. And um, when we talk about that, we use them to deceive our people. Because when they got tired of their drama, they were like, who are these people? Just let them go. So what we have at times 
is we have our, um, there is this cash word, um, nothing about us without us. Despite that, we still have our government sitting, having their discussion, cracking their brains on what the urban poverty solution look like without taking us along. We don't really want that. What is the outcome of the conversation? Nothing. The outcome is to even add to the poor poverty that we're talking about. The, the, the outcome is to even cause us more pain. When we talk about um, natural disaster, we also have what you call man-made disaster, that is the picture. So what are they thinking? What is that discussion? What plan do they have for us? Absolutely zero. So what we are to, what our plan looks like, we have our community lead data for enumerations, profiling, with the help of a crew of SDI called New York City TV, both local and international. We have our data, our accurate data. We trust our data. So they can also trust us with that. They should use our data to plan with us, not for us. And also, we also have our plan on institute upgrading. They should support our effort in that. When we talk about institute upgrading, how to upgrade our community to provide basic um, services, just like admission, toilets, and so on. We have all this plan, which is we are hoping to achieve. Let them support us for that. That is what we are hoping for. And it would be good to see some of that incorporated into Nigeria's um, yeah, exactly. National Climate Action Plan, right? Yeah. And whenever we have our, our chance to speak with them, they normally complain about, we do this because we need our phone, we do this because we have options. There was a day I had my chance to discuss with one of them, why are you guys using first television on us? He said, that place is shanty, that place is not healthy, that place is this, is that, and we didn't have option that to, to just put those everywhere to, to shift out you guys away, or how will I go use it? And I was like, oh my God, you open your mouth to say all that. Did you know that you have a plan? Did you know what he said? He said, you have a plan. Slum dwellers. You have a plan. I said, yes, we have a plan. Did you ever consider to even discuss with us what do they have in place? We have a plan. If fund is your problem, we can also try to source for it. Come, let's plan. Let's know what you have please, let us also bring our own to the table. Then by so doing this, we will have a mutual resolution. But so, for, so, sorry, so shocking, early this year, I mean last month, we still have an eviction in one of our communities. They render those people ho homeless. What is our fate on that? We thought we had won that in 2017. But here we go, still have another eviction happening. I wonder what we have to do. We just need them. No, absolutely. It seems to me that there's a, a real need for the government to listen uh, a lot more and actually understand that the solutions are there in many cases, but they need to go and look for them, right, and understand what they are and, and, and listen to people. Sheila, um, the work of the Global Commission on Adaptation, um, to what extent um, is the Global Commission planning to raise the game um, on adaptation in the coming year? I hear it has quite an ambitious agenda. And how is it going to work with governments, whether Nigeria, Bangladesh, uh, on, on raising the profile of adaptation on the international stage? First of all, I want to say that everything is still cooking, which is really sad. We keep saying we don't have time, but we have no action ready. And that's a tragedy. So I want to go back to your earlier question, because I don't think that we have anything serious to say about, at least I don't have anything to take back on behalf of my constituents. I don't, I have, we are so many networks involved in this process, there are many who are watching because they are very skeptical about global promises. <gasps> Everybody that I know, including myself, think all these commissions produce papers that go into library and produce PhDs for somebody. But I think we, I, my organization supported me to be in this so that we learn the politics of this process. 
And what we want to do is given an opportunity to disrupt this present architecture in which somebody else decides something and has 100 and, and our governments have 150 excuses why the people are excluded. So we want to bring in a paradigm where we say many locals make the new global. And in adaptation, I think that's what we have to do. We don't need a cookie cutter approach. We need every locality to be able to identify its immediate and long-term imagination. We need scientists and people with technology to come and work with us, not throw things at us, not throw solar things at us, and wind things at us, and agriculture at us. And we also want to demonstrate, you know, we, you have all these different sections, you know, it's like the bodies, you have hands, you have but it's one organism. So today when you talk about, you know, today all your themes, as people who live in the city, we are equally committed to every one of those things. Every slum dweller has imageries of hunger, of dealing with their rural counterparts, their kingship groups. They are concerned about all the issues that we talk about. They need a chance to participate in things. So I think that's one. The other thing is every time after we come here, we decide what to do. Can we flip it and say, let's use this year to come and celebrate what we have done. We have a year. Excellent. So let's do it and let's put a mirror to the face of people who haven't done things. Because you don't have time, no? We keep saying we don't have time, but we keep procrastinating and saying somebody else has to do this, then I will do this. So we as, as grassroots networks are saying, we're already doing everything we can. Let's look at who's coming to partner us. If you have the guts, come. Well, Matt, do you have the guts to come? The World Bank has the guts to come. Um, yeah, so Louise, I mean, in that respect, um, what are your plans for the coming year? Um, and how do you expect to raise the bar? Um, what are the key milestones in the run-up to the global <coughs> So I already talked about the money that we are going to put on, the resources we're going to put on the table, but I also want to share about a bit about the how. And I also, as a newcomer to this process and to this agenda, I also want to share just two points that have struck me in the last couple of days and as I've been preparing and coming up to this event. And the first, and I think it says it very well there on the wall, we're not only in a climate crisis, we're in a social crisis. There are people feeling left out, there are people excluded, there are people, as we know, as we've been hearing on this panel, and as you know all too well in this room, who don't have enough to eat, who don't have enough water, who don't have basic services and access to education and a voice at the table. But we're also hearing from the streets, from the middle class, who feel disenfranchised, who feel that their aspirations haven't been met. And we've seen them on the streets in France, and we've seen them on the streets in Iran, in Ecuador, in Chile, complaining about rising carbon taxes, about rising energy and transport prices. So we also have a whole population that, in a sense, is feeling disenfranchised. And I don't think that we can do climate policy independent of social policy. So we need to get both of those issues together. We need to take countries where they are. We need to take communities where they are in this process. And as you mentioned, not have cookie cutter solutions. So that's just the first thing that has struck me. And the second one is, wow, there's so much going on, but it feels somewhat at times disjointed. The people arguing on room, or negotiating, I shouldn't say arguing, on Article 6 are in their world. And the rest of them, the grassroots NGOs that I've met are doing fantastic things, but they're in, at the other end. And we're all, the researchers are not sure if they're speaking to the communities. And so everybody's running around asking for quick action. But I, I would like to see more unity of the different voices coming together around this agenda. So what I'd like to see in the World Bank and what I'd like to see us support are national climate uh, dialogues and forums where these different groups can come together in a somewhat quasi-formal structure and engage with the government where your slum dwellers can come and sit beside the academics who can sit beside the, some of the donors and some of the local actors to say, okay, these are the issues, this is and to talk about the social side and to talk about the, the climate side. I mentioned earlier we're doing community-driven development. We're also supporting decentralization efforts that bring climate finance down to the local level. That's really good, but that's not enough. As you've also been saying, it's not just giving the money, it's empowering those communities to be in the driver's seats. 
yes, we work with them to say, what are your values? What are your plans? Where do you want to go? Are your practices consistent with your values? But still, that's, I think we need to even give them more power to be driving this agenda. And as geeky as it may sound, I think we need to give them data and information. Yes, communities know better than we do about the impacts of climate change, but they can't always articulate them. So I'd also like to see the bank and others supporting giving the communities the ability to monitor. We now have a whole new world that we need to take advantage of in this fight on climate change, which is the digital world. Giving the communities the access to that they have the smartphones already, but helping them monitor what is critical variables and using that to advocate for themselves and using that to think what are their long-term implications that they may have to address because of climate change. And so I think what is missing is not only the finance, but coming together to have a dialogue Bring, working together also with the private sector, bringing private sector finance to this. I should say the IFC part of the World Bank is putting also $100 billion on the table in the next five years, which is huge opportunities. Also on the urban agenda, we were talking earlier about public-private partnerships, bringing together local communities, governments, and the private sector to deal with some of the very expensive challenges climate change is posing in urban areas. So I think the thing we need to do is get the different groups together at a national level, at the community level, empower the communities to be the drivers. Data is one way. I'm asking them what they want is another, but it's, I think we need multiple ways to do it. And so that's what I'd like to see. Thank you. It's very interesting that you talked and brought up this aspect of social justice and all the unrest that we're seeing in various countries around the world. And, you know, people have been raising this at the COP, including um, ministers such as the Chilean environment minister um, and others. I mean, it is now glaringly obvious that perhaps one of the reasons for this is the failure um, to act on, on climate change globally, nationally and, and at the local level. Um, and I'm just wondering, Salim, how do you think these aspects of social justice can be incorporated into the national climate action plans, the new ones that are supposed to be submitted by the end of next year? Is there time for these kind of dialogues? Is there, is there space for this kind of thing to be incorporated, incorporated into the NDCs at this point? Or is it too late for this round of NDCs? So let me answer your question with two halves. The first half is that the actual climate has gone ahead of talking about it. Right? So the talks are now redundant. The climate has changed, people are being affected, and in the countries that we come from and I come from, we are tackling the climate. Right? We don't know what an NDC means or a NAP means. These things are irrelevant. This is a completely different artificial language created here to talk about something that was supposed to happen in the future and we didn't do anything about it. Right? So it's too late. This process has completely been left down, which is why we have Greta telling us exactly that we, are, we just failed. And so, the reality on the ground is way ahead of the talk taking place here. But nevertheless, we don't want to give up. Right? So I've been here for 25 years. I'm not going to give up. I'll, I'll come to the 26th no. if I'm still, I'm still alive. And I have a very uh, strong proposition for anybody from the UK government who's here, or the Scottish government, because to me it's a Scottish cop, not a uh, British cop, is a notion that I put forward after the Paris Agreement, which is to make future cops inside-out cops. By that, what I mean is that the, the negotiators negotiate decisions, but they don't actually deliver on them. And the Paris Agreement gave us a decision that we can all take and deliver on. It gave us the freedom to deliver on, to implement. We just can all now become part of the implementation strategy. And so we should be the ones given center stage at the COP. And I've told this to the British government. In Glasgow, they give us, Development and Climate Days, the main platform every single day for 14 days. And we will fill it with people who are actually doing things, implementing things, and we give the negotiators a back room where they can sit and argue as long as they want and they will argue till the last minute of the last day because that's the way they work. We're halfway through and they've done nothing. Nothing has been agreed. I'll give you just one very small example uh, uh, to illustrate this. 
Okay, so one of the articles we agreed in Paris, and we were, we were partially uh, uh, um, part of that decision, was Article 11. I'm sure nobody in this room knows what Article 11 is. Hands up, anybody, Article 11? Nobody, art, Article 11, okay? Article 11 of the Paris Agreement was on capacity building. And we, the developing countries, particularly the least developed countries, argued going into Paris that a lot of money was being spent on so-called capacity building to fly in experts, do a workshop and fly them out. We call them fly in, fly out capacity building. Picking a box, leaving very little behind. And what we needed to deal with the climate change problem was building capacity building institutions at the national level for long-term capacity building to tackle climate change. And therefore, we asked for a separate article, we fought for it, we had some resistance, but in the end, we won it. And Article 11 now calls for this long-term shift into national capacity building. We set up, as the UNFCC always does, a committee to do it. It's called the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. It's a very good committee, actually, and they have been doing some very good stuff on this. One of the things that they did, which we have helped them to do, is something called the Capacity Building Hub. So for those of you who walk in every day, when you enter from Hall 2 to Hall 4, I ask you to look to your right, and there's a, a room that's labeled the Capacity Building Hub. For, from the 4th of this month till the 11th, seven days, we are running, the Paris Committee is running a daily session from early morning to late evening on capacity building. Each day has a different theme, transfer all the different themes of the, NAS, of the UNFCC, but capacity building on those themes. And these institutions are coming and sharing what they're doing, and it's about practice, it's about doing things. And I, I know many of the people in this room have been to one of these sessions or run one of these sessions. In contrast to that, there is an agenda item on Article 11, which is to give the mandate, a further mandate to the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. The, the difference of opinion is, should it get four more years or should it get five more years? They've been talking since Monday. As of today, there is no agreed text. They haven't been agreed four or five. Does that make any sense at all? How more absurd can you get? Okay, so do things, stop talking about doing them. <laughs> Thanks, Celine. Talking sense as usual. Um, okay, so we're gonna open up now for some comments uh, or questions from the room. Um, can you wave your hand if you have a comment or question and just keep it nice and brief, please? So we'll take about three and then come back to the panel for whoever would like to answer that. Uh, there's one coming towards you now, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Very, very enlightening conversation. Thank you for what you're giving us. I would just like to add another dimension to the social and climate crisis, is the environmental crisis. Let's not just think social and climate. The environment that supports our life is dying. So we need to add that to the complexity, and that's the only way we're going to get out of this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments, questions, suggestions? Yep, over there. Fantastic. So, panelists, please consider the environmental crisis and what you'd like to say on that. Um, yeah, I, I just had a, a question touching upon what Salim said at the end of this panel uh, session just now on uh, capacity building being more than flying experts in and out. So I was, I was wondering specifically what are some of the ways you think about building sort of institutional capacity or sort of establishing a capacity that can be developed upon? Is it partnering with uh, the creation of businesses locally? You know, it can involve outside expertise. And, and I just would like to hear just a little more on that, if possible. Maybe other panelists also have some, some nice uh, information to share. Do we have one more question? And then we'll come back to the panelists. Okay. At the back. Uh, At the back, thank you. I'm Ruth Spencer from the Caribbean island of Antigua and Bermuda. I've been following DNC for the last maybe four or five years. And I'd like to recommend going forward that the Caribbean region be given a voice in DNC because 
we are the ones with really urgent crisis. Hurricanes, we live six months out of the year in hurricane mode, not knowing what's going to happen. It's our local community groups that are proactive on island. We are doing the work, a lot of volunteer, in kind resources, and we are pushing the processes. And I'd also like to appeal to the donor agencies that you have to find enabling mechanisms such as reputable local groups to put your resources in because when you channel them to the regional development banks, they stay in the have a project cycle five to eight years, 36% implementation. So what does that mean for the local groups? You know, we are behind track. We want to do more, we want, we are pushing, but our hands are tied. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so who would like to tackle the environmental crisis? Um, you work quite a lot in terms of, um, you know, broad remit and um, how does your work take into account the environmental crisis, as our, our colleague was saying over here? I'd like to raise this question to remind me of what he said. Yeah. That we need to take into account the environmental crisis as well as social and, and climate. Um, is that something you feel is happening anyway um, in the communities that you work in? Yeah, um, what, let me just refer to what we are doing in terms of, uh, I call it empowerment, save the environment. Um, in term, when I say save the environment, it's just like um, we do like go out with a team, of the university team um, to um, make sure that we put in place of those trash and to cause we realize that um, the trash also like embark in terms of flooding um, when it's really it's right really blocks some of the aspects well we feel like the water should like flow out of the communities so what um, our people, what we do is we go out, we do the cleanup, um, and we also look for a way of trying to maneuver, or prevent the environment against such thing. So I don't, I don't know if. So maybe there's not so much of a division actually in practice. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of all part of, of the uh, of the same thing. Salim, how about capacity building? Can you add a bit on that? Sure, so um, I mentioned earlier that the paradigm that we have spent actually quite a lot of money on, like the order of a billion dollars over the years on so-called capacity building, I use airports for it, a fly-in, fly-out consultants coming to all the countries in the developing world, help us write an app or help us write an NDC. These are trivial exercises, they build no capacity at the national level. On the other hand, and, and they're the consultants, the international consultants flying in and doing this, right? So the money is going to international consultants from the developed countries, not to people on the ground. And yet, every single country, I work with the least developed countries, there's 47 of us. Every single one of us have more than one university. My country, Bangladesh, has 100 universities. And if you look at how much of that billion dollars went to universities in our countries, zero, right? Went to consultants in the developed world, but it didn't come to us. And so what we are now doing is we're building our own capacity. We have a least developed countries, universities, consortium of universities where we do have some capacity, not a lot, but some capacity, and we're working to build that and share it with ourselves in a south-south capacity building modality for long term, because we are going to be teaching, building the capacity of the leaders of our countries in the future. And we want those leaders of the future to be resilient leaders to understand the concept of resilience we're building long-term capacity, not short-term capacity to write a little report, which is what most of the so-called capacity building gets uh, uh, given to. If I might also take the planet, the emergency question. Just another indicator of showing the level of understanding in, in my country, Bangladesh. A lot of uh, parliaments around the world, including the European Parliament, most recently have adopted the climate emergency language that Greta has been promoting and declared climate emergencies. The UK Parliament's done it. The European Parliament's done it. The Bangladesh Parliament, the chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Environment, 
asked us to help them write one. But they have, they have declared a planetary emergency, not an, only a climate emergency. It's both an environmental biodiversity emergency as well as a climate emergency. The, the level of understanding is that they understand the connection between the two and not, not just bandwagon jumping on climate. And the chairman of the standing committee is uh, coming to, uh, to Madrid tomorrow and he's giving a talk on this day after tomorrow if anybody's interested at the Bangladesh Pavilion. And he's a very, very erudite person and I would recommend listening to him. So one of the gifts of coming into this space is for us to clone the capacity building concept that Salim talked about, to say, how do we create cadres of community leaders who have both the confidence and an understanding of their locational work to challenge and participate as partners with the people that you produce? And our capacity building is going to be very different from yours, but the content will be the same. So how do we do that? Now that's, that for me is a gift of this association. But the other thing which is to do with the environment, which Bisola says, is that all, all vulnerable groups end up living in the most difficult situations and are accused of degrading the environment, whether you're fisher folk or you're native, uh, tribal people, or you live in forests, or you live in slums, you get the worst land to live in, you get no amenities, and everything you do is an accusation of you destroying the environment. So it's like a double, it's, it's like a double deficit. And I think that a very important part of our work is to trip that around, and to change that, and to, you know, and to to look at ways by which we also produce a new normal, you know, because the other thing is whether you are talking about middle class people who are getting uh, their lives, even slum dwellers, getting their lives destroyed by these present crises in economies. You have to also give them an opportunity to leapfrog. I think everybody is looking at this with all doom and gloom. I think that if we are smart, we can leapfrog. Why do we need to go through 15 steps? You know, why do all of us have to have small cars, big cars, bigger cars, and then say, no, we go back to cycles? <laughs> why? So I think same with, with energy, with uh, transport and everything. And I think that, and food, you know, and, and the deep connection between urban and rural food production. So I think that, I think, you know, and that's the thing which is a gift of poor people. You know, they live in such difficult situations. I get depressed, I go and sit there. <laughs> Your resilience. spirits come up because yeah. that's, how, that's their resilience. And yeah. we have to celebrate that in a positive way. Instead of just saying, oh no, you know, they get flooded, yeah. but they survive and they're still smiling. Yeah. This point about being, uh, being a, a lot to learn, basically. Those communities. Um, Louise, perhaps you can address the question about the Caribbean and getting money down to the local level. Sure, uh, no worries. Um, the Caribbean, I, I couldn't agree more. It's a region that faces tremendous vulnerability, and it's a region where I can just say the bank is engaged more on the, on the disaster risk mitigation side. Also, on, there's vulnerability on the macro side, as you know, as well, on service delivery. So I just couldn't agree more that it is a country that faces multiple dimensions of vulnerability, economic, multiple social dimensions, and clearly climate dimensions. And it is indeed an interesting priority, I was going to say a case study of what can be done, because the countries are small, but much can be done. I just did want to just compliment very briefly what was said on capacity, because I just want to say, first of all, I think a lot of the communities do have capacity, and it's about empowering them to use and show that capacity, which is why I made the point earlier on data. I also have heard some really fascinating examples here while I at the COP about training in schools that build on uh, training locals in dimensions and jobs that are important for climate uh, fight activities. So it could be measure, being land surveyors, it's working on irrigation, it's working on water and sanitation, on food security issues. So we can build capacity not only at the university level, but at the high school level. And then also the importance of building capacity through uh, 
that training the public. I think there's a lot that can be done by media, maybe through these national climate change dialogues, to build the capacity of the public to understand both the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, and the link uh, to, to social. Uh, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, we cover climate change in all its dimensions, solutions, as well as, um, you know, the news about the fact that we're not doing enough. And we find that, you know, some of the most popular stories on our uh, website are the ones that actually talk about resilience and solutions and what people are actually doing on the ground rather than the apocalyptic uh, stuff that comes out of reports, uh, scientific reports, etc. So I, I definitely think there's more room for the media to also um, improve understanding around the solutions as well. Are there any more comments or questions? I could take maybe a couple more and then we'll, we'll wrap up. There's a gentleman here down at the front, if we have a microphone. Thank you. My name is Aston from Malawi. I uh, was just interested to maybe I can learn more on the new paradigm shift which you mentioned quite a number of times for most across. In terms of, I'm not saying smallholder farmers are not to be targeted, no, let's continue to be targeting them. But now if you see in terms of productivity, they're still so fragmented, fragmented to able to meet the productivity which we desire. Why don't we also move away from them a little bit to target the medium scale farmers with adequate financing so that we boost for productivity at that level? Because smallholder farmers in Africa, I'm from Malawi, they have not yielded the way we expected. What are we saying about that? I mean, can't we target a second tier of group? Not right scale farmers, they're already doing something about it, but they can't still cover the gap in terms of distribution of food between low producing uh, areas and high producing areas. Now we distribute across to target the medium scale farmers who are equally educated, they have capacity but they have limited financing capacity. Okay, thanks very much. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, take one more over there. Thank you. I'm Mark Alkowitz from Vanderbilt University in uh, the U.S. I'm very impressed with the least developed countries' capacity building and the other comments that have been made. And one of my curiosities is whether or not that can be extended in a leadership way to the developed countries. Because uh, the least developed countries are experiencing a lot of the things that we're just starting to see the, the early stages of in, in places like the U.S. We're now talking about strategic retreat. And there's been um, you know, three 100-year events in the last 10 years. So in many respects, we're going to need to learn from everyone else. I was wondering if anyone wanted to reflect on whether that makes sense or even how one would go about doing it. Okay, was there one more hand over there? Yeah, last one, I think. We won't have time much more, so. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, not such a technical comment. Um, my name is Aisha Constable. I come from the Caribbean and from Jamaica. Um, one of the things that we have discussed over the past few days, and I know in particular today there was a conversation around grief and, and um, climate, and we've talked about eco-anxiety and fears, and I speak more so on behalf of Caribbean youth who are themselves, you know, um, <coughs> confounded by the realities, afraid, anxious. Um, we talk about dreams and young people just feeling a sense of despair talk about young women who are choosing not to have children because of the concerns that they're bringing kids into a world that's, you know, doomed. So the doom and gloom of it. And so my question then, um, and I don't know if you can answer, but I want to put it out there for us to ponder. What do we say to young people who, you know, in the midst of all that's going on, the conversations we're having, the search we're doing, remain very despondent and fearful and do not know exactly how to process, you know, what's going to happen in the next few decades. Because for all the talk we do and all the, you know, research that we do, on the other side of it, there are people whose lives we are trying to touch and people who have to grapple with these concerns, you know, and, and how do we make sense of it in our daily realities and remain hopeful? Okay, thank you so much for that. I think that can actually be our last theme. Um, so if you would like to answer any, any of the other two questions um, that were relevant, but also um, just in terms of wrapping up, 
Yeah, what, what would you say to young people who are really worried about what's happening in the world, the fact that not enough is being done? How would you <coughs> aim to, to give them hope? Who would like to go first? Can I go first? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so let me um, uh, frame a little bit the issue of learning about adaptation and, and uh, uh, sharing that knowledge at the global as well as at the national level. One of the interesting features of adaptation as a learning uh, process is that it is a learning from practice. It's a learning by doing process. If you're not doing anything, you're not learning anything. You're not learning from models and computers. You need to be doing things and then learning by doing what to do, what not to do, what does work and what doesn't work. And if you want to learn about a problem, the best way to learn about it is find somebody who actually has the same problem and did something about it. And if they found a way to deal with it, then go and find out from them, which is the antithesis of the way we normally share knowledge, which is we send an expert to go and tell people what to do. Right? In adaptation, there's no point in me going to tell you in Malawi or in, in Jamaica what to do. But what I will do is invite you to come to Bangladesh. Come and see what we are doing, because we are going up a learning curve faster than any other country in the world. And that includes you, Mark, in the United States. You want to learn how to deal with floods, you have to come to Bangladesh and see, we are doing it. And this also applies to the question about, you know, depression. I've been thinking about this over the last couple of days, and, and I, I, I agree with Sheila's point, you know. I, I invite, particularly my friends in the developed world who are suffering from anxiety and depression, do come to Bangladesh, spend some time with the communities there who are at the front lines. They are not depressed, they are doing stuff. Come and spend time with them, and then you'll go back refreshed, and you will be energized. Uh, and I make you a serious offer. If you pay for yourself to come to Bangladesh, we will look after you in Bangladesh. The communities will look after you. You don't have to pay for that. Thank you. Okay, you may be inundated with a request for people to come and visit after this. Okay. Okay, Salim has a lot of capacity. <laughs> we have hospitality. We're not money, hospitality. That's what we're offering. Human hospitality. Excellent. You stay with us, you meet with us, you spend time with the community. Excellent. Okay, Sheila, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for final comments. I think, uh, you know, uh, I think the most critical and important thing to remember is there is power in collectivity and there is power in aggregation. And those of us if we as a community decide we want to do something, it's more than the sum of the number of people here. But we, we've, we've moved into this space of too much individuality and transformative behavior, you know, all these things. And I think that is, that's a very reductionist kind of way of looking at things. So I think we have to go back to the power of the collective. We have to go back to the power of the collective endorsement that is needed for transformation. Because change can only happen, you know, we've seen in history, that's how change happens. It doesn't happen out of one person's genius. That's the mythology that we produce in history a lot. So I think that, I think that's what we in, in development have learned. And we, we learn this way. Everybody has the opportunity to experiment, to fail, to stand up again and learn. And when you learn and you do something, it's your obligation to teach 10 other people to do it. That's how transformation occurs. That's how the politics of the new uh, overcomes the kind of stress that poor communities face through evictions, through the destruction of their lives, and through the, through the leaky bucket syndrome in which they live. And also that young people feel that there are and, others taking them along. And I think everybody here has to understand that in most of our countries, they represent the majority of the population. And they do not have any patience. So the other challenge that we all have to face, you know, you talked about riots, you haven't seen anything. You really haven't seen anything. 
we talk about uh, we talk on uh, about this you know parents you know people of our generation when they came as poor migrants they had a lot of patience with all the crap that governments and municipalities and elite people shoved on them the kids are not like that they are citizens they are noisy and you don't give them what they want they will destroy whatever is left so you don't have to wait for climate they will destroy it so we are in that very difficult zone and the reality of today's world is that we are only listening to violence somebody burns buses somebody comes on the street and be, when there's a peaceful procession you just get ignored and so that's the message that we have to share that young people do not have the patience and they have no respect for us they you know this is this is very genuine compared to what some of us <laughs> thank you shin louis well, i was going to say there's a consensus and i still think there is a consensus definitely amongst the panel because coming from the world bank people often look at me and think finance but it's really not yes and finance is important it was the first point that i made but it's really about people first thriving being included and leading and i there i really very much agree with what tashila has said and my fellow panelist salim it's really about taking ownership it's yes the bank and other donors can do so much but coming together as youth coming together as a community asking for what you want deciding and taking action is the best and owning your future i think is so much the best way forward because we've seen aid is very important finance is absolutely necessary but we also know it's not enough and i think that's the change where we're all headed is in empowering communities and empowering individuals to take action so finance is essential but it's not sufficient okay thanks Louise. Bisola, um as the young person on, on the panel um, do you feel encouraged by what you've heard today? What do you, what would you like to hear in order to make sure that you and others in your community do not feel overwhelmed and overpowered by, by the prospect of climate change? Yeah, from what I've had so far, I feel really, yeah, it's just because um, I feel there is a point of hope here. <laughs> Let me say that. And um, we, we stand on the world of hope and hope of transformation. And in terms of um, what Madame Sheila said, like uh, young people are not, they are impatient, I need to address that. Because I can't just be on the floor and you try to point the street hard or not. Actually, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's like you call me into sports of fighting and I'm ready to defend the young people. Yes, of course, we are impatient. As far as we don't really understand the reasons for why and things to happen, we are impatient. But we are patient and we are so sweet to deal with when we understand the part of the reasons. Yes, we, 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 we are. That even reminds me, when four days ago, there is this whole people that we are like talking about the economy. And I have to turn everything around with a serious argument. And the old man has to say, young girl, calm down. Young. And I was like, no, don't tell me that. And the old man has to boil his twin straight. But when he explains the reason why and it happened, I calm down and I try to reason with it. What am I trying to say? Let your reasons, let it be well known. By so doing that, you surely see that we the youth, we are not violent people. We are sweet to deal with it. And we are just <laughs> So with that, we're going to wrap up the session. Um, I think we'll leave the last word with Basola. Young people are sweet to deal with, and if you engage with them, we can go a long way together. Old, young, <laughs> World Bank communities. Uh, so no excuse for not doing that, really. Um, OK, with that, I think we're going to get to the really fun part now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Pablo Suarez. Um, of the Red Cross and we shall exit the stage at this point.